Amen. What a great victory we have in Jesus Christ. Praise God. All right, open your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of First Chronicles. First Chronicles, chapter 4, and uh, we'll be reading the first ten verses. First Chronicles, chapter 4, <coughs> beginning in verse 1. The sons of Judah, Pahaz, Hezron, and Carmi, and Hur, and Shobal. And Rehiah, the son of Shobal, begat Jahath, and Jahath begat Amulai, and Lahad. These are the families of the Zohathites. Zoh and these were the father of Edom, Jezio, and Ishma, and Ibash. The name of their sister was Hezeloponai, Poini. And Peniel, the father of Gedor, and Ezer, the father of Hushash, these are the sons of Hur, the firstborn of Ephra, the father of Bethlehem. And Asher, the father of Tekoa, had two wives, Hela and Nairiah. And Nairiah bare him Ahuzim, and Hefner, Hefner, and Timani, and Harash, and Terah. These were the sons of Nairiah. And the sons of Hela were Zareth and Jezoar. And Ethan, and Cos begat Anub, and Zobiah, and the families of Aharel, the son of Haram. And Jabaz was more honorable than his brethren. And his mother called his name Jabaz, saying, Because I bear him with sorrow. And Jabaz called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me. <clears throat> And that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. And may we look to our Lord now in a word of prayer. <clears throat> our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before thee, Lord, thanking you for your love to us, mercy and grace and watch care over us. Thank thee, our Father, for the privilege that we have to come to the house of the Lord today. And I thank thee, our Father, for allowing us the privilege of worship I thank you, Father, that we have and we live in a country where we can come and freely worship and read your word. I thank you for the songs that we have sung today. I thank you for the hearts of the people that are here to sing those songs. It was so glorious to sing about how we are redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and how we have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you this morning, Father, for these songs. I thank you for our members. I thank you for this church. And I ask, Father, that you would be with us in all that we do. And may we bring honor and glory to thy name. And there are many requests that have been made known unto the church. Many of our own people stand in need of prayer. And those that I may not have even mentioned today, Father, I pray that your blessings would be upon them. And we do want to pray, as our brother mentioned, for this upcoming election on Tuesday. And Father, I pray that you would just guide us as we go and as we cast our vote, as we do that which we are blessed to be able to do in this country, and that is to elect our president. And may you give us great wisdom and understanding as we go and we elect. And Father, we ask that you would be with our country. Oh, we have sinned. We have sinned. And Father, we're thankful that thou art God and thou art in control of all things. Father, I ask that you would again be with me as thy servant. May you give me liberty and ability to present thy word of truth and in love. And if there be any here today that are lost, that know you not as Savior, that this would be the day of salvation. Forgive us of our sins and these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Moving out of your comfort zone. Moving out of your comfort zone. So, last week when I was preaching about why do we struggle, I talked a lot about because, you know, really, at the end of the day, we're not in the Word of God like we should be. We're not in tune with the things of God like we should be. And, and then I prayed about, and I even, I know I mentioned the possibility of going through a message and, and giving uh, tips and helps on reading the Bible. But this message came to my mind as I was going through, as I was reading, and I came to verses 9 and 10 here, 1 Chronicles chapter 4, about our comfort zone, and I pray and I think that you will find that it actually complements the message from last week. 
as we go through this? Well, we start off by saying that everybody has a comfort zone, right? There is a certain temperature at which we feel most comfortable. Some like it extremely hot, some like it extremely cool, some like it somewhere in between, but we have a comfort zone. And then there is a way of life in which we feel at ease. There is a crowd of people that we feel most comfortable. And when we're around a different crowd, or in a different type of situation, in a wrong crowd, a wrong situation, a wrong place, and doing wrong things, we become uncomfortable. It's not our comfort zone. We find ourselves outside our comfort zone. When we find ourselves in that place, we typically become a little nervous, a little anxious. And there's nothing wrong with having a comfort zone. So let me just, let me just say that. It proves that we are interested in being comfortable. But there is a sense when comfort can, can become a thing of concern. That's what we're going to talk about. Now it's easy to reach a place as individuals where we become satisfied with the status quo. We so structure our lives to the point that we can almost predict what will happen from one day to the next. Now I'm not saying that all of us are prophets and that we're saying that we know, right? We, we know that only God knows tomorrow, but we live our lives in a way that we structure them that we, we, we pretty much know what's gonna happen. For many, this kind of stability provides a deep sense of security and well-being. And again, I wanna say I don't feel that there's anything wrong with that in the way we live our lives. I think you all know for sure that I like to live my life with structure and schedules. I have a time that I like to wake up and a time that I normally like to go to bed. I like things to be done in order. And I feel very, very strongly that schedules and structure are good for our children. However, and what we're going to talk about today is when the same style or the same type of comfortable living invades our spiritual life. When we are comfortable just to do the things that we do, why do we struggle, right? Because we live in our comfort zone. We live in the zone of, well, yes, I occasionally read the Bible. Yes, I kind of show up. Yes, I do just enough. Again, there's nothing wrong with being satisfied with your job. But when you become satisfied with your service to our Lord, that's when it's a problem. There's nothing wrong with being comfortable with your home, with your automobile, with your financial standing. But when we become complacent about our prayer life, when we become complacent about our spiritual growth, it is at that time we need to move out of our comfort zones Spiritually, we should never reach the place or we should never come to the place as a child of God when we are totally satisfied with our walk and our witness to a lost and dying world. We shouldn't become satisfied in that. We should always desire to want to do more. We should always desire to want to live a more clean life for the Lord. We should always desire to learn more spiritually. We need to come out of our comfortable comfort zones on the spiritual aspect of our lives. If there has ever been a child of God, if there has ever been a Christian, if you would, that had ever reached a place where he could be satisfied with his spiritual progress, who do you think it would be? Many are probably thinking the Apostle Paul. Yet, even the Apostle Paul remained unsatisfied in his spiritual growth and reached for more. Turn, if you would, to the book of Philippians, chapter 3. Philippians, chapter 3. Verses 12 through 14. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, 
But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I have apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything be, and I'm sorry, and if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. So if any man had ever come to the place where he has done and, and felt like he has done all that he can and gone as uncomfortable as he can, for the service of the Lord Jesus Christ, many of you would agree with me, it would be the Apostle Paul. And he says to us clearly here in Philippians, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that, I may apprehend that which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. I count not myself as to already have attained all that I can do. I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. In other words, not just relishing in all that I've done for you, Christ, and thinking about all the things that are behind and all the struggles that I went through and all the persecutions that I faced and all the letters that I have written and all the countless of hundreds, maybe thousands of people I've witnessed to, not just resting in that, but yet reaching forth unto those things which are before. Wasn't content to stay still. Beloved, not only, not only, do many individuals live in a spiritual comfort zone? But so do many churches. We get comfortable. The attendance is good. The offerings are fine. We may be tempted to back off and take it easy. <clears throat> we may not pray for the church as we should. We may not invite others to join us as we should. We may not be active as we should. It's easy to become satisfied with the way that things are. You all know the reality of that, right? The sad truth of that is when a church, a church family becomes complacent, the church begins to die. A church is in serious trouble when it becomes satisfied and complacent in its comfort zone. Look at Revelation chapter 3, and certainly Revelation chapter 3, and I'm going to read a lengthy portion here, could be preached on the entirety or the rest of this message. And to be honest with you, it was almost the text, and I almost did go down this way. But I want to read to you these scriptures about lukewarmness, about complacency in our church. Now, in, that could happen in a church, I should say. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee, to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye slave, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him 
and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The Lord had very strong things to say to the Laodiceans about their lukewarmness, their complacentness, being neither hot nor cold, just going through the motions. So you may be asking, how do we move out of our comfort zone? How do we not struggle in our Christianity? How do we not struggle about the things of God? And I think that the answer can be found in the verses that we have read today, in this prayer of Jabez. We can see some facts in the Word of God to help us move out of our comfort zone, both as individual believers and even as a church. Well, let's look at this this morning. First of all, we will see Jabez and his personality. And then secondly, we will look at Jabez and his prayer. Literally, we'll look at verse 9 and verse 10. And Jabez was more honorable than his brethren, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bear him with sorrow. Noteworthy things are to be said about Jabez in this verse. Three things. His place in life, his problem in life, and his performance in life. These three things reveal a lot about his character and about his desire to rise above the ordinary in his walk with God. Well, let's look first of all about Jabez's place in life. Now, I read to you not because I enjoy reading lineages and not because I am outstanding in the pronunciation of names in the Word of God. But I read to you the first eight verses of 1 Chronicle as we see more of the genealogy of the nation of Israel. And as we read those verses, for the most part, it's a collection of begats, broken only by a few insights into the lives of a few notable persons, such as Jabez. And then, straightly after, in verse 11, we go into more of the genealogy, more of the begats. But we have two verses here in the middle of this genealogy that speak about a man named Jabez. When we come to Jabez, we are confronted with a man whose life is like an oasis and a dry and barren desert. A man who the Word of God says was more honorable than his brethren. Israel was in a time of desolation. Israel was in a time of ignoring the things of God, ignoring the prophets of God, ignoring the warnings of God. Sound familiar? Hello? We're there. We're living in a nation that outright ignores the things of God. We're living in a nation that spews at the things of God. The, living in a nation where the, the things that God calls an abomination are nothing more than an alternate lifestyle. We're living in a time and a day when our Supreme Court says that marriage can be accounted as legally and morally significant and right as it is for a man and woman, for a man and man or woman to woman to be married. How disgusting and deplorable of a time in which we live. All the more reason why we need to get out of our comfort zone and speak about the uncomfortable. Listen, I'm not trying to say anything about me and I'm not trying to compare my life to the life of Jabez, but do you think for the first 10 minutes of the announcements today that that's comfortable? Do you think I enjoy speaking about those things, speaking about Paul? I don't enjoy that. But Jabez was living in a time of desolation. As we read through the genealogy, as I said, 
Most others simply state that they begat sons and daughters and they died. But it appears that Jabez wasn't content to be like everyone else. He was honorable. Beloved, there are few, myself included, there are few among us as humans who rise above the crowd. But there are few who leave and mark upon the world. Most of us are content to live like everybody else around us. Those that have departed. As we think about those that have departed, some names are mentioned often while others never come up. Why? Well, some that have gone on before have left a greater mark. And I'm not just, I mean, those that God has left for us, we understand there are things I'm just talking about in our world, right? Some people that die and we talk about, and others we don't. <clears throat> but 10 years after deaths, will it matter? Sadly, few people leave a permanent mark on this world. Fewer still leave such a mark about the things of God, right? <clears throat> we should never be satisfied, as I said earlier in the message, in our growth of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> God has called each of us and has gifted each of us in wonderful ways. You can turn over to 1 Corinthians 12 later. I'm not going to read through it. You can write it down if you like. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 26. What's it talk about? It talks about the body of Christ. It talks about the gifts. It talks about, you know, those that are less honorable, we can store more honor, right? It talks about how our eye is necessary, how our hand is necessary, how our foot is necessary, how God has tempered together the members of the body. That God is, in, in fact, of course, the head of the body. And we come together. And God blesses us, His children, with many talents and many things. He gives us the means whereby we can stand out in front of the crowd and be different for His glory. Now some people are different just for the sake of being different. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is that we need to be different because of what the Lord has done in our lives. Because of the work that the Lord has, because of the change that God has made to us. Yeah. To not be content to be like everyone else. Well, everyone else lies, everyone else cheats, everyone else, you know, drinks, everyone else sins, everyone else does this, and I'm a little bit better than that, so I'm okay. We should not live in that comfort zone spiritually. We should be different, and we should be bold, and we should be honorable among the brethren, as it was said about Jabez here in First Chronicles. <coughs> be different because of what the Lord has done for us. If I were to die today, you may miss me for a while. Some may miss me more than others. <laughs> but 10 years from now, what is Mount Vernon going to say? What mark, what difference have I made? How have I come out of my comfort zone to share the love of the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm not trying to shame all of us. I'm trying to encourage us to do more for our Lord. So we see his place. <laughs> he was honorable. Now, also we say, well, preacher, we have a lot of baggage. You know, we're carrying a lot of stuff with us. You're telling us to come out of our comfort zone, but you know, we got all these things going on. Well, you know what? Jabez had a little bit of a stumbling block himself. His own mother called him Jabez because I bear him with sorrow. How do you like to carry that around? <laughs> right? Jabez, 
I'm naming you that because, you know, I buried you with much sorrow, and basically, you know, you were really kind of, you could just fill in all kinds of adjectives, whatever Jabez's mother might have said. That's not a really encouraging feeling for Jabez, <coughs> right? <laughs> the, she, she named him Jabez, which literally means the son of my sorrow, that pain and affliction he will cause me. And so many people we could say with a name like that, they figured, and Jabez could have figured, well, that's it for me. My mother doesn't want me. I was born out of sorrow and all these different things. But you know what? Praise be to God. It doesn't have to be that way, does it? Amen. It doesn't have to be that way. We have the power through the Holy Spirit to break free of the chains of our past. You know what, beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what he is? He is the great chain breaker. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the way maker for the children of God. And we don't have to be held down by the sins of our past. We don't have to be held down by the weight of this world. In fact, it says in the book of Hebrews to what? To lay aside the things that weigh us down. Amen? You know what, Jesus Christ breaks us free from the bondage of sin. And he breaks us free from the guilt and the shame of our past. That's easy to rest in the guilt and the shame. It's easy to rest in those things. But Jesus Christ, He is the great chain breaker. He is the way maker. The Lord Jesus Christ, as I said, <coughs> is able to break us from the bondage of our sin. He's able to break us from our past guilt and shame. It is Christ and Christ alone that saves. It is Christ alone that frees us from the bondage of our sin, and it is Christ that has the power to save us from our sin. Turn, if you would, to the book of Acts, chapter 16 and verse 31. Amen? Acts 16 and verse 31. You just get excited while well, I just get excited. I get excited when I think about how, what the Lord is able to do in our lives and what the Lord is able to do in the life of a lost sinner. You know, Acts 16, 31, the Word of God says this to us. It says, And brought them out and said, <coughs> Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, what did they say? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. This jailer was ready to kill himself. He had some weight, didn't he? <laughs> he had some sin. He had some things weighing him down. But who is that great chain breaker? Who is the one that is able to free us from the bondage of sin? None other than Christ Jesus, our Lord. The Apostle Paul, Silas, they say unto him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Ephesians 2, right? 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. <clears throat> I've passed. I don't think there's anybody in here that would be able to raise their hand and say, I have a past. I have a sinful past. And to my shame, I still sin now. But I'm <clears throat> thankful that Jesus Christ, our Lord, has freed me from the bondage of those sins. And those sins don't hold me down anymore. Oh, yeah, the devil, he tries to throw them in my face. He tries to do all those things. But listen, we also do the same when we want to remain comfortable and not growing. Amen? Or look how far I've already come. And I really wouldn't be able to go before a drunkard because I was a drunkard. Listen, man, if you were a drunkard and you're not anymore because Christ freed you from that, you go. And you can tell them about how Christ brought you out from being a drunkard. Get out of that comfort zone. Just because everyone may think we fail doesn't mean we have to, amen, by the power of God. Just because we're taught some bad things growing up doesn't mean we have to live that way right now. Jabez had you in my sorrow. I bear you with sorrow. My mom don't even want me. I'm not going to do anything. But the Bible says that Jabez was honorable in the sight of his brethren. 
And in the midst of all of this genealogy that picks right back up in verse 11, these beautiful verses mentioned about Jabez, who didn't just fall within the begat, didn't just fall within the crowd, but I see that Jabez went out. <clears throat> just because our family was a certain way, or we're raised a certain way, or we have even a certain reputation, does not mean that we have to remain that way forever because of the power of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Because of the power of Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm saying that we have the ability, not of ourselves, but through the power of God to rise above and to go out and do mighty things for the Lord. To rise above and do mighty things for the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10, I think you'll like this. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Right? Paul says, yeah, I went out and I labored and I did things for the Lord, but not because of who I am, but by the grace of God which was with me. God's grace is what? It's amazing grace. <laughs> it's wonderful grace. It's saving grace. God's grace truly is amazing. And remember, if you're here this morning and you have been saved by the grace of Almighty God, covered by the blood of the Lamb, that God is the potter and we are the clay. And you know what? He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Right? He's taken this marred vessel marred with sin and disgust. God is helping me. God gives me the strength to go out of my comfort zone for the glory of God. God is able to do that for you this morning, His child. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He says to us in John 14, 6, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. <clears throat> and so I've already talked about it, so I'll talk about it quickly. But you remember I said there were three notable things in verse 9 about Jabez. And we talked about his place in life. We talked about that problem and we talked a little bit. And now we talk about his performance in life. And the Bible says again that Jabez was more honorable than his brethren. This simply means that he was worthy of more honor than the rest of his family. Jabez was not remembered as a great leader, a great prophet, or a great preacher. Jabez did not make his mark on the battlefields of life. But Jabez is remembered because he was a man of prayer. His name is remembered because he was a man of God in a godless day. Men of courage, women of courage, where are we? we got to get out of our spiritual comfort zones and be warriors. Brother Terry, and I don't mean to take away from the devotion, but every, well, I don't know if it's been every year, but most years, goes to the verse there in Psalm, and I, I can't recall it now. This just all came to me. If I was more prepared, I would have had this, right? goes to that book of Psalms and talks about our need to be, basically what I'm talking about, spiritual giants in this world, and, and many of us say, well, I can lose my job, right? That's what he usually talks about. I can lose my job. I can lose this. I can do all these things. Is God sufficient to take care of us? Amen. He is. He is. <laughs> There's no, right? But my God shall supply all your need. How? According to his riches and glory. <clears throat> right? Through Christ Jesus. We don't have to be like everyone else, when it comes to standing up for God. And when we learn that, and when we learn that we don't even have to seek to please other men, what have we learned? That as God's children, our desire is to please our Heavenly Father. And to do that which He has told us to do. In 1 Corinthians Chapter 10 and verse 31. 
1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. All to the glory of God. And you know what? In the book of Matthew, what does it say? We are to be light in this dark old world, aren't we? We are to be lights for the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn over to Matthew chapter 5. And we're almost to the second part of the message. Have no fear. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Ye are the light of the world. Woo, that's a responsibility. <laughs> you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither. You know what? Let's just take that for a second. You know, when I'm driving, and sometimes we drive all night down to Florida, and we drive different places, and sometimes when we come back, or as we're going through Atlanta, you know what? That is a city that is lit up, and you can't help but to see those lights, right? You know when you're in Atlanta by the lights. And you know what? Even Columbus, a much smaller city than Atlanta, I know when I'm in Columbus because of the light. You are a city on the hill, a light that should not be hid. Beloved, get out of your spiritual comfort zone and go and be a light into this world. Neither do men put a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Get out there and be that light. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. I know it's not easy, and it's, it looks easy, and I have a smile on my face, and I get excited, and I like to preach, and all those things, and I know then somebody in the world's going to come, and they're going to bring up your past, they're going to bring up your guilt, but listen again, Jesus Christ, He freed you from that guilt and that sin. And it's Jesus Christ that we must proclaim <laughs> by the power of Almighty God. And I see here in verses 9 and 10 of 1 Chronicles 4 that Jay pass, and what we read was determined to live for the Lord. And this should be the heart's desire of every child of God to live for the Lord. In the book of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and God's word says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. That's who we're living for. Christ Jesus our Lord paid the price and covered our sin. Not that we have to go around trying to please every man, but that we live and present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. Amen? That's what we've been talking about. Don't, don't, don't conform yourself to this world, but rather, but be transformed. Amen? <clears throat> By the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, for I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. We're not great because of anything we have done. So don't get too, you know, wrapped up in yourself, but by the power and the grace of God. All right, well, secondly, let's look at Jabez's prayer here in verse 10. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thy hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that they may not grieve, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. We're going to see that Jabez prayed for prosperity, Jabez prayed for power, and Jabez prayed for protection. Jabez prayed for prosperity. First, he prayed for the Lord's fullest blessings upon his life. You say, oh, how could he do that? Jabez called upon the God, or called on the God of Israel, saying, oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed. He did. And then he prayed that his boundaries would be extended. It would appear that Jabez was not satisfied with the status quo. He asked for two things. He asked that, he asked for God's blessing. Jabez desired the fullness of God's blessings be upon his life. Who among us doesn't want to be blessed by God today? 
You didn't walk in here saying, boy, I hope I'm not last. Boy, I hope the singing stinks. Man, I hope the preacher is horrible. Man, I hope I leave here feeling worse than when I came in. I don't think any one of you came in here thinking that today. Who doesn't enjoy the blessings of God? We enjoy the blessings of God. And God loves his children and blesses us. Amen? <laughs> he loves us. And he blesses us. There's nothing wrong with praying for God to bless you upon your life. You know why? Because we're not talking about money or possession or power. We're just talking about God's blessing for your life. We're seeking that which we can do to glorify the Lord. And let me say, if you are here and have been saved by the grace of Almighty God, then you already have the very best that God gives. And that's salvation to His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, being covered by the blood of the Lamb. That's the very best. It's amazing. So, <coughs> don't be satisfied with the mediocre. Don't be satisfied just to dwell in the comfort zone. Break away from the ordinary. <clears throat> Go out. The disciples in John chapter 21, they tried to operate in their own energy with the, the fishing, right? It's talking about the fishing in the nets. and They went out to fish and they were operating their own energy and they were trying to do their own thing. They weren't very successful. But when they began and they listened to God, what happened? The Lord filled their net so much that what? They began to break. <laughs> we need to do and go where God tells us to go. He asked for God's blessing, Jabez did, in praying for his borders to be expanded. Jabez was asking the Lord to help him to have more of a godly influence in this world, in the desert that he was in. Remember, Jabez, more honorable, an oasis in a desert and barren place. It would seem that Jabez was not content to dwell in his comfort zone. As believers, we must not be satisfied with the status quo. And I believe that God is calling each and every one of us to get out of our comfort zone and go out into this lost world. In Matthew 28, in Matthew chapter 28, we know this is the Great Commission, right? Matthew chapter 28, 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you, and lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. As long as we are satisfied where we are, we're going to be pretty limited in our outreach. But when we trust the Lord to move us out of our comfort zones, oh, what a blessing. Jabez prayed for the power of the Lord. Jabez asked the Lord to put his hand into his life. Jabez was not content to be like others when it came to the power of God. Knowing that the God of all power is able to give every one of his children all the power needed to get out of our comfort zone to do more for him. Amen? Isn't God able? <laughs> he is able because he is the God of all power. We don't have to settle for weak, powerless lives. And then Jabez prayed for protection. Jabez continued in his prayer with a request for protection from sin and evil. Jabez was simply asking the Lord to help him live for God. I have one more verse for you. Turn over to Psalm 101, verse 3. This should be the attitude of every child of God. We ought to hate everything that brings dishonor to the name of the Lord. And David said it best when he said here in the Word of God and the inspiration of God, in Psalm 101 and verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside and shall not cling to me. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. <clears throat> this would be a good prayer for us as God's children to get into the habit of praying. As we seek for God's blessings 
It is so that we can continue to go out and tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. We should pray for help facing life day by day and staying pure for the glory of the Lord. As we close, no, I am not Jabez. But if we're willing, not willing, if we should move out of our comfort zone and tell others about the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think you would see remarkable things in your life. <clears throat> May God use His Word and add the blessing to it. Thank you for your attention to the Word of God. Shall we stand together to be dismissed in a word of prayer?